Darkcast Network, the light shines brightest on our indie podcasts. Mary Johnson hadn't been acting like herself for months. She and her husband were having marital problems, and she was thinking about next steps. The 39-year-old was staying with friends, only returning home to shower and pick up more clothes. On Friday, November 25th, 2020, Mary started walking toward a church in Tulalip, Washington, but she never arrived. It would be nearly two weeks before she was reported missing, at which point Mary Johnson became part of America's growing problem of missing and murdered Indigenous women. When a person goes missing, there's a special kind of pain in the not knowing. I want to tell the stories of those who never came home. I want to tell you the story of Mary Johnson. I'm Kona Gallagher. And I'm Ethan Flick. And this is And Then They Were Gone. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome. Thank you for joining us once again. This week's story is part of a larger issue that I've been wanting to talk about for a while, which is missing Indigenous women. Did we have an Indigenous person before? Yes, we did. Um, In season one, we brought you the case of Bear Diaz, who was a 20-year-old member of the Barona tribe who went missing in 2015. But indigenous women and girls specifically go missing and are murdered at an alarming rate in this country. Indigenous people make up only about 1.1% of the population here in the U.S., but account for 4.6% of all missing individuals. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So this is obviously a very disproportionate number. And part of the issue behind this is that these cases often aren't publicized as much as their white counterparts. But of course, like all missing people, Mary Johnson has family members and friends who love her and who are desperately searching for answers. But before we get started, we'd like to take a moment to thank the lovely folks who have joined us over on Patreon. So thank you very much to Jennifer W., Lauren C., Carolyn K., Reagan F, Marie M, Rachel C, Madison L, and Justin F. Mm, I, kn- <laughs> I know quite a few of those names, actually. <laughs> yes. Well, this one you know very well in that he is your brother. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> so thank you, Justin, for finding us over uh, over on Patreon. And um, can't wait to, to hear what you think of Ethan's other show. Ooh. <laughs> Hadn't thought about that. (laughs) Anyway, it's going to be fun. Um, So (laughs) thank you very much. If any of you would like to join us and get these episodes early and ad free, along with Ethan's show about mental health, you can do so over at patreon.com slash ATTWG pod. But enough about us. Let's get to Mary Johnson and her story. Mary Ellen Johnson was born on August 31st, 1981 in Tulalip, Washington. Mary is a registered member of the Tulalip Tribes of Washington. Her sisters, Jerry Davis and Nona Blowen, say that she's a talented artist and was always the life of the party during family trips. She also loves Will Ferrell and apparently does an amazing Ricky Bobby impression that she would bust out to cheer people up. It's, that's interesting. Yeah, that's, very that's specific. Very, yeah. <laughs> she also loves cats. Um, at one point, she had a fat tabby cat that she named Little Man, and she taught him how to walk on a leash. <laughs> cat, uh, <ugh. laughs> cats on leashes freak me out. I don't. I don't know why. That's weird. <laughs> It's weird to have a cat on a leash. I mean, yeah, but it's also, I feel kind of charming. It just freaks me out. I don't know, <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> well, but regardless, Mary seems pretty fun. Mm-hmm. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a ton of background information on her. I actually don't even have the name of her husband or how long they were married. 
I do know that the couple was living with Mary's sister, Jerry, in Cedro Woolley, which is about 45 miles northeast of Tulalip. But they moved out abruptly and went to Marysville, Washington, which is only about six miles east of Tulalip. After the move, though, Jerry says that she didn't hear much from her sister. Like Jerry would try to call her, but Mary would rarely answer or reply to texts very often. After they moved to Marysville, the relationship between Mary and her husband became strained. By late 2020, Mary was staying with friends, as I mentioned in the intro. Right. Tulalip Tribal Police Department Detective David Sally gave an interview to CNN and pieced together the last days that Mary was seen based on cell phone records and interviews that they had conducted with people who saw her. So this is the timeline, like, as best as we have it, basically. On November 24th, 2020, Mary returned to the home that she shared with her husband and packed a suitcase. He then drove her to a friend's house on the Tulalip Reservation. The plan was for Mary to stay the night there and then go to another friend's home in Oso, Washington, about 30 miles away. Mary's sisters did an interview with Jada Pinkett Smith on her show Red Table Talk, And they told her that these friends in Oso are a family that Mary would stay with when she was trying to get clean and sober. Mary did struggle with substance use, but her heading to Oso does indicate that she was, you know, trying to do something about it and trying to get into a better place. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if Mary knows how to drive or what the situation is there. She has a license or doesn't, but she doesn't have a car. So she had to rely on people like her estranged husband to give her rides places. And that was the plan on November 25th as well. Her friend who she was staying with was supposed to give her a ride to a church nearby in Tulalip. There, Mary was supposed to meet another friend who was going to take her to the home in Oso. But that plan quickly fell apart. Apparently, there was another guy staying at the friend's house on the reservation And he wanted a ride somewhere, too. Okay. So this house that Mary's husband dropped her off at had some other random guy staying there as well. All right. But Detective Sally says that the friend whose house they were staying at backed out and didn't give either one of their house guests a ride. Okay. Yeah, so Mary started heading to the church on foot, accompanied by this this other guy who was staying at the house. Now, most of the players in this story are unnamed, so it's kind of hard to keep track of all of them. But as Mary and this unnamed man were walking down Fire Trail Road, the man who Mary was supposed to meet at the church drove up. Gotcha. Now, this was around 1.30 in the afternoon, and this is where the story starts to get a little weird. Now, this guy who drove up was supposed to give Mary a ride from the church to Oso. He pulls over and sees Mary with this other random guy who was also looking for a ride somewhere. I have no idea where he was trying to go. But the guy in the car told them that he only had room in his car for one person, So instead of just telling Mr. Rando, like, sorry, buddy, I'm supposed to take Mary to Oso, don't have room, bye. Yeah. He didn't give either one of them a ride. (laughs) That's weird. Yeah. So I don't know what that's about. It seems very strange to me. Yeah. So he just, like, took off, and Mary kept walking toward Hmm. the church. At some point shortly after this, she calls the couple in Oso and begs them to come pick her up. Now, it's unclear if this was a voicemail that she left or if she spoke with one of them, but in either case, they did not go and pick her up. What's with everybody bailing on on Mary with I have no cars? idea, like, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, her estranged husband's the only one who actually gave her a ride someplace. Weird. Yeah. Then, around 2.30, Mary called another unnamed woman, but this woman told police that she told Mary she was too busy to speak. And that was the last anyone ever heard from her. What what was the time difference there? It was about an hour. So it was about an hour between when the guy drove up uh-huh. and when Mary made this last call where somebody spoke with her. And 
presumably she's at the church this whole time. Yeah, or, or like close somewhere to around the, church. the church. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But even though Mary seemingly wasn't able to get a ride, police do believe that somebody actually did come and pick her up. That's because Mary's cell phone pinged near Oso later that afternoon. Now, police don't give an exact time for this, but they did say that it was too close to her last sighting for her to have walked all the way there. Because again, we're talking 30 miles. Right. Mary's cell phone pinged again the night of November 25th back in the greater Maryville to Laylip area. Police say that the phone remained there until the next morning when it powered off. So there's a, there's no actual evidence that she made it to those places, no. just the phone. Just the phone. So the phone started out in Tulalip, made it to around Oso, and then back to Tulalip, and then powered off. But we have no sightings of her in Oso. No. The only sightings of her were in Tulalip, and the last physical sighting of her was that driver at around 1.30. Or the guy who she was walking with. So, right, yeah, yeah un- let's talk house about guest. exactly. Let's talk about these like random men. Police have identified and interviewed them both. The man who was supposed to give Mary the ride to Oso says that he did not see her after that. And the random guy she was walking with says that they went their separate ways that afternoon and he hasn't seen her since either. Now, despite the fact that she apparently never showed up in Oso, the couple whom she was supposed to visit didn't raise any alarms. And now this could be due to Mary's substance use issues, because if she was going there allegedly to, you know, get clean or whatever, like they could have assumed that she just decided against it. Yeah. And maybe she had had done that in the past. Yeah. And we just don't. She's using. Yeah. We just don't know. So it's not the weirdest thing, you know, if somebody is. Deciding to get clean to at the last minute decide not to. I mean, that's a pretty typical pattern. But I don't know. I mean, it's also weird that Mary called them that afternoon and begged them to come get her and they didn't. And then she didn't show up. Like, that seems concerning. Yeah, definitely. So, yeah, I just, I don't know. You know, unfortunately, we just don't know. And by this point, remember, too, that Mary was only in sporadic contact with her sisters, so they didn't necessarily think that anything was wrong either. Plus, she was estranged from her husband. Yeah. So all of these factors led to Mary Johnson not being reported missing until December 9th, about two weeks after she was last seen. And it was her husband who ended up calling it in. So that's a long time. Such a long time. So while police have gotten a lot of criticism from activists and Mary's sisters for the way they've handled this case, it's worth mentioning that they were absolutely starting at a disadvantage. Oh, yeah. I mean, you think about, you said two weeks. Yeah. I mean... That's enough time. Uh, any most leads would potentially be gone. Witnesses might not remember seeing her at mm-hmm. you know given locations because you know she she may have been somebody inconsequential that they passed in the street. Yeah, you know what I mean. So that's 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 tough. Yeah, I mean if it's she, tough to start the investigation two weeks later. Yeah, if if she had taken off, she could be anywhere. If somebody had kidnapped her, she could be anywhere. If You know, somebody harmed her. She could be anywhere. Like, it's just, you don't know. When you don't even get a missing persons report until two weeks after the person was last seen, like, you're more than behind the eight ball. I mean, like, I don't even know a better sports analogy, like (laughs) kicking a field goal with no feet. I don't know. (laughs) That would be difficult. (laughs) The point is, if Mary had fallen victim to foul play, the perpetrator had plenty of time to either hide her or get rid of her body or any other evidence. Right. Plus, any potential surveillance footage from her route was likely gone. Mm. So it was really definitely tough. Beyond that, one of the reasons that missing Indigenous women cases don't get investigated effectively is racism, obviously. But beyond that is a simple fact of bureaucracy. When someone goes missing or is the victim of a crime on tribal land, it's a jurisdictional nightmare. Right. It's the reservation police. Right. 
And precious time is often wasted determining who's in charge between the tribal police, the state, or the federal government. Right. Abigail Echo Hawk, who is the chief research officer for the Seattle Indian Health Board, says that these jurisdictional pissing matches can often affect whether these women live or die. I mean, of course, she didn't characterize them as pissing matches. I'm sure she's much classier than that. But like the point stands. Echo Hawk went on to say, and this goes hand in hand with the racism, that there's a lot of victim blaming that goes into these cases. Quote, they are assumed to have been killed, murdered or disappeared. They're assumed to have run away, to have had substance abuse issues, to have done something that caused them to go missing or be murdered. End quote. And that sentiment was echoed by Mary's sisters when they were on Red Table Talk. They felt like they were given priority at the beginning of the investigation. Mm -hmm. But when Mary's case wasn't quickly solved, investigators just kind of backburnered them. Plus, there is the simple fact that the media did not react with nearly the same amount of fervor as they do for missing white women. Yeah. And I know if somebody has made a drinking game for the show, you've probably took a shot right after I said that because it feels like I talk about missing white women syndrome in every episode, but that's because it's there, you know? And when it's, it stops being real, like yeah, I'll fucking stop talking about it. Right. It's very much a real thing. I mean, and just anybody that listens to this podcast, we've proven it. Like yeah. how, how many how many episodes have we covered where a minority goes missing and like no one's heard about it. Yeah. You know, not just me, because I never hear anything about anybody, but just across the board, it's like every, everybody knew Gabby Petito mm -hmm. in her case right away. It was national news, but there were minority women that went missing around the same time. They got no exposure. Yeah. And, and it's so interesting when, you know, I've been doing research for, Every single episode that we've done after Gabby Petito, just about, has mentioned her in some of the more recent articles because that case, and we've talked about it before, really did shine a light on the disparity of media coverage and police response between white women and non-white women. And that's something that the Gabby Petito Foundation is absolutely working toward and is doing, you know, making great strides in taking this tragedy and using it for good and trying to get more attention to cases like this. So it's very interesting that like every, I mean, in half of the articles that I used for sources for this episode, Gabby is mentioned um, for that exact reason. But yeah, the other issue with cases like this is exactly what Abigail Echo Hawk said is that like people just, even if they don't consciously have this thought, there is this like feeling of, oh, well, yeah, that's just what happens. Yeah. Anita Lucchesi, who is the executive director of the research group Sovereign Bodies Institute, had a quote that really puts a fine point on this idea as it relates to indigenous people in particular. Quote, that kind of narrative about indigenous people just lends itself to more violence so that when this violence does happen, it's not a disruption of the social fabric the way it would be when it happens to somebody else because we're already perceived as not part of the social fabric because we're either dead and disappeared. We're less than human. We're so far away on some remote reservation that we're not part of the rest of the community, end quote. Not part of the social fabric. That really resonated with me. And she's right. And now, okay, this is a very weird anecdote, so bear with me. Okay. I don't think I've told you this before, um, but this is exactly what popped into my head, this story, when I read this quote. About 15 years ago or so, I was working in New York City selling comedy club tickets in Times Square, and the people who worked with me in this weird company was like an extremely random bunch. One woman was a young Indian woman from London. She was like maybe 21 at the time. And I was only a few years older, but like she just was one of those people who just felt like she was a lot younger, you know? Yeah. Anyway, we got into some weird conversation 
when she said that she didn't think Jewish people existed. What? Yeah. Like, not that she thought they were made up, but that they were from olden days. Like, they're around in biblical times, but that they didn't exist anymore. What? Yeah. And so, like, of course, me being an intellectual, I was like, but uh, uh, what about Jerry Seinfeld? Like, <laughs> I, you know, I, and she was like, I, yeah, I have no idea. She she never made, she knew Jerry Seinfeld was, but she had never made the connection. That he was Jewish? Yeah. And that, like, Jewish people are, like, people in our world who have existed forever and continue to exist. Uh Uh-huh. I know. It's very strange. And I bring it up because I feel like indigenous people are treated kind of like this in our country. They're seen as something that we learn about in history class. And while we do know that they still exist, they're over there on reservations. Yeah which a lot of us don't really have much of a concept of. And I think it's different when you live on the West Coast or, you know, and you live... Somewhere close to the reservations. yeah. But as, you know, we both grew up on the East Coast. Right. Not near any of this. And I think that it really, there is like a separation in the way that you often perceive these people. Yeah. So there is definite social erasure of modern indigenous people. They are othered. And when people are othered, there's just not the intrinsic empathy there in the broader cultural consciousness. Like there is for someone who a police chief can get up and tearfully say, she could have been my daughter. We assume that the police interviewed everybody. Yeah, I mean, they did identify, like I said, you know, the people who she was with that day. Um, They have her phone records. Right, but uh, again, two weeks, that's a long time. And without having any witnesses placing her anywhere other than the church, like, what what do you go on? Well, yeah, not even the church, Fire Trail Road. Right. On the way to the church. Yeah. Yeah. Detective Sally does say that Mary's case is still open and active and that they've identified several persons of interest, but they don't have enough to make an arrest. He also says that the lack of a body makes it difficult for them to get specific search warrants, which we hear in every case. Yeah. Plus, the fact that they don't know for sure if she disappeared from the reservation or not brings up those jurisdictional issues that I mentioned earlier. Right. They don't know if they can use federal grand jury subpoena powers or not, which like, okay, so the CNN article I read that that was in um, Mm -hmm. where he's like, yeah, you know, jurisdictional issues. We don't know if we can use this federal grand jury subpoena, blah, blah, blah. It was written 10 months after Mary was last seen. So like, I feel like they should have been able to figure that out in the interim. Like I get if you don't know right away if you can use these powers, but like. It was 10 months after her disappearance. I feel like that is enough time to make a phone call and figure it out. You would assume so? Yeah. Yeah. Sally went on to say, quote, We don't know if she was kidnapped, held against her will, if she has been murdered. It could be argued maybe she just wandered off in the woods and got lost. Maybe she overdosed and passed away somewhere in a remote area, and we don't know where she's at. Maybe she's just hiding. Maybe she's in treatment. There's a lot of maybes, end quote. Curious, did uh, you probably don't have this information? It doesn't sound like the police are putting a whole lot of information out there, but I, I wonder if the ex husband, how cooperative he was with the investigation. I, I wonder if an estranged husband is somebody that you would think, of would, course, would that's be the top first of the person. list, yeah, right? Yeah. So I'm just wondering how cooperative he was and if they got a chance to get into the house and search the house, anything like that. It's, I'm, yeah, I don't know about if they search the house from what I understand, he has been, um, you know, pretty cooperative. Mm -hmm. Um, it's, it's interesting though, because when I first read like the, you know, the two line summary of this case, it's like, okay, a woman, a strange from her husband disappears. He doesn't report her missing for two weeks. You're like, okay, Uh, I think we all know what happened here. Right. Right. But then, you know, once you get into it and you realize that like he dropped her off, she was fine. Other people saw her, 
like nobody saw him around her after that. Right. She was around all these other people. There yeah. are reasons why he wouldn't have known she was missing for two weeks. Right. Like it's definitely the case isn't exactly what it would appear on the surface. Sure. So, I mean, not to say that he has nothing to, I have no idea. No, right. We just don't have anything to really go on either way. Yeah. But it's, it's definitely not cut and dry. Whatever happened. Yeah. I don't love that quote that I read from Detective Sally. He's like, well, maybe you should do this. Maybe you should like, okay, yeah, those are all of the options, I guess. <laughs> sure. But like, that's why there needs to be an, an investigation. Like right. the answers aren't always just handed to you tied up in a bow. Right. And that's how Mary's sisters feel. So they said on Red Table Talk that while investigators did conduct interviews and piece together as much of the timeline of the last days Mary was seen as they could, they didn't do any hardcore searches. They said that they brought cadaver dogs out like once and they brought them like around Fire Trail Road where she was last seen, but that they were only out there for like an hour mm -hmm. and they didn't hit on anything. And that from what they were saying, from what the sisters were saying, that was like the only official search. Mm. So, yeah, I mean, half the things that he said in that quote, like maybe she got lost in the woods, which she grew up on. She didn't get lost yeah, in the woods. Like that's, that's stupid. Yeah. Maybe she went somewhere far away and overdosed. Like, again, that's pretty stupid too, but like, okay, sure. But half of the things that he's suggesting would be helped by a search. Yeah. It would be helped by somebody going out into the woods, seeing if there's anyone out there. Right. Like, you know, it's just, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Like the, it really seems, and this is again, kind of what her sisters are saying that they, when they got the case, they did the things you would want them to do. They pieced together her timeline. They pulled her phone records. They interviewed the people who were last with her. And then it seems like they and just stopped. And then they stopped. just stopped. Yeah. Like, and they didn't stop for Gabby Petito. You know what I mean? Right. Like they, oh God, the resources that were used. Yeah. You know, she was found in a remote place, like in the middle of absolutely nowhere. Yeah. And you, in, in that, two in, weeks. In, and in that case, you had multiple jurisdictions mm -hmm. cooperating together to yeah, find her. Exactly. So I feel like even though there are these jurisdictional issues, like they could cooperate with each other and do a proper investigation or a proper search. Well, exactly. And so Nona, Mary's older sister, told CNN, quote, if that was a little white girl out there or a white woman, I'm sure they would have had helicopters, airplanes, and dogs and searches, a lot of manpower out there, scouring where that person was lost. None of that has happened for our sister, end quote. And yeah, that's the thing. Like, granted, missing adult is often different, but Gabby Petito was an adult. I mean, you know, yeah. yes, we often don't see searches go that hardcore for missing adults, but like, I mean, come on. They, yeah. they do something. Yeah. I mean, they at least walk around Yeah, where, where they were last seen. Yeah. So while this investigation has a lot to be desired, and ha there's a lot more that can be done that seemingly is not being done or has not been done. It doesn't mean that nothing is being done about the problem of missing and murdered indigenous women in general. Mary went missing from Washington state, which has the second highest rate of missing and murdered indigenous women in the country. In August of 2021, their attorney general, Bob Ferguson, created a 21 person task force to address this problem. It includes members of Washington's tribes and tribal organizations, as well as state and local policymakers. Well, so at least he's trying to do something. Well, yeah. like I mean, it's, That's good. It's definitely a step in the right direction, but it's only a step. Right. You know, I don't think any great systemic problems have been solved by a government task force. <laughs> sure. But at least they are talking about this in an official capacity. Right. But that's not all. Abigail Echo Hawk, who I mentioned earlier from the Seattle Indian Health Board, recently worked with the King County Prosecuting Attorney's Office. King County is where Seattle is. Mm -hmm. 
to train staff and reform databases to properly collect tribal information and racial identities of indigenous people. Because apparently another problem in all of this is that many indigenous people are often misclassified as Asian or Hispanic. Really? Yeah. So a lot of times if, um, if a body is found, it's, and it's an indigenous person, oh. it's misclassified as Asian or Hispanic. And so, again, with the stats, with the investigation, everything gets messed up. Yeah. So she's working to help train people to fix these database errors that are another hindrance in these cases getting solved. On a federal level, in November of 2021, a year after Mary's disappearance, President Biden signed an executive order directing federal agencies, including the Departments of Justice, Interior, and Homeland Security, to create a strategy within 240 days to address, quote, the crisis of violence against Native Americans. In the order, he said, quote, for far too long, justice has been elusive for many Native American victims, survivors, and families. Criminal jurisdiction complexities and resource constraints have left many injustices unaddressed, end quote. In addition, the Department of Justice said that it would be allocating $800,000 to the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, NamUs, to provide outreach, investigative support, and forensic services to cases involving American Indians and Alaska Natives. And like we love NamUs, and this is so, so, so good to see because in late 2020, their federal funding was cut to the point where they thought they were going to have to shut down completely. So in at the end of 2020, NamUs made an announcement. They're like, oh yeah, by the way, Starting in January 2021, we're out. Like, we don't have any money. Why? Well, think about who was in the federal government in late 2020 and what their priorities were and what their priorities were not. That's just, it's crazy to me. That's nuts. Yeah. So it was really an 11th hour save that allowed NamUs to continue. So the fact that not only do they have the funding that they did, but they're getting this extra $800,000 to help with this specific issue is excellent news. And they do so much amazing work for missing and identified people all over this country that it would be an absolute tragedy if they could no longer operate. The Department of Justice also announced that they're going to dedicate over $90 million in award grants to launch a committee dedicated to tackling the crisis of missing or murdered indigenous people. $90 million? $90 million. Holy shit. Yeah, so I'm so hoping. So it, like I said, that's in award grants. So I'm just really hoping that that ends up being used in a way that can bring about change. Because, you know, it's just when you have government and money and everything, like, who knows? But right. it's it's definitely a heartening thing to see. And these are all good steps. But again, none of it solves the problem. We have hundreds of years of policy and shitty attitudes to dig through. And throwing money at the problem isn't just going to magically solve it. But, you know, I'm trying not to be overly cynical and recognize that this is a baby step in the right direction. Right. It's progress. Because talking about this, making policy, like allocating funds, it all helps. It helps dummies like you and me realize that these problems exist and they're happening all around us. To people who maybe can't be our daughters, but could be our neighbors. Like Mary Johnson is exactly our age we probably like we would have graduated high school together the Tulalip tribe has pledged a fifty thousand dollar reward for information leading to mary's recovery and now over a year after her disappearance the fbi is officially involved good yeah they have pledged an additional ten thousand dollars bringing the reward total up to sixty thousand mary johnson is one of us she is loved and she deserves to be found her sister Nona told reporters, quote, My sister is a wonderful person and we all love her dearly. If you have any information, please just reach out to your local law enforcement, the Seattle FBI, or the Tulela PD. Bring her home. We miss her. End quote. Mary 
Johnson has been missing from the Tulalip Reservation in Washington State since November 25, 2020. She is a Native American female, and at the time of her disappearance, she was 5 foot 6 and 115 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes, a sunburst tattoo on her upper right arm, and a beauty mark on the back of her neck. Mary was 39 when she went missing. She would be 40 today. Anyone who has any information on Mary Johnson's disappearance, please call the FBI Seattle Field Office at 206 622 0460. Or you can submit a tip online at tips.fbi.gov. You can see all of the sources for this episode along with photos and videos at our website and then they were gone.com. And be sure to follow us on social and then they were gone pod on Facebook and at ATTWG pod on Instagram, TikTok, and Twitter. If you like what we're doing, please subscribe and consider leaving a five star review on Apple Podcasts. It will help new listeners find us. And the more people that listen, the more chances we have of bringing someone home. And we'll see you here next week for a brand new episode. See you next week. And Then They Were Gone is hosted by Kona Gallagher and Ethan Flick. All research, writing, and editing is done by Kona Gallagher. Theme music is The Stork by Ketza. Additional music is provided by Kai Engel. And Then They Were Gone is a Little Monster production. Hey, you get